Um, hello, everyone. Um, nice to see you. I'm conscious I'm between you and lunch. I'm happy to say it's a very healthy-looking lunch. Um, but the purpose of today really is to... Uh, I'm always amused by this photo. Um, I'm covered in makeup, and the photographer tells you to put your head forward because it decreases the jowl, apparently, uh, under there, if it's a professional photo tip. Uh, uh, for it's a rather depressing day. It's also rather depressing being a middle-aged Englishman working in a Scandinavian technology company where the average age is 32. Uh, you can swiftly get a complex as you wander around the office, but I, I digress. So purpose really of today, just to give you a glimpse into some of the things that Scandinavia does um, and some legislation that it actually has and some of the things that are perhaps slightly different, but also I think some of the things that are actually the same. You know, they're very common, you know, really wherever, wherever you are. So between now and lunch, as I say, just a glimpse into that. Um, what gives me the opportunity or what, how am I qualified to talk about this? Well, I mean, I'm not completely qualified as such, but I do believe um, Benefi is a technology company founded and headquartered in Stockholm. We're about 400 people, 250 of whom work in Scandinavia, and we have about probably about 800,000 people who use our technology in those regions. So we do know a lot, of course, about the area uh, and the region um, itself. Um, the first thing, actually, I think there's sometimes a bit of confusion about, well, what actually is Scandinavia? You've got the Nordics, you've got Scandinavia, you've got the Baltics. Well, sometimes, I mean, you know, what are all these countries? Because sometimes people actually slot Finland into Scandinavia. But if any of you ever did, I'm just here to tell you it isn't. It's part of the Nordics. Scandinavia is Sweden, uh, Norway, and Denmark, if any of you had any doubt about that. So I thought I'd just define, define it there. And then really starting with just a few tips and insights into what goes on uh, in, in Scandinavia. So there's something called the um, wellness contribution, which allows uh, employees to spend a tax-free contribution on health and wellness each year. And actually, recently, it's been quite interesting. They've recently introduced legislation where you're now allowed to spend that tax-free on golf and horseback riding, whereas before they were deemed too expensive, really, to be included in this. And that's the average amount of money that an employee spends on this wellness contribution each year. Actually, they have also recently capped the amount you can spend as an employee to £420. So you can see the average is about half. But again, you know, especially in Sweden, this sits really at the heart of you know, what employees want to do. Because 90% of companies in Sweden use and make the most of this arrangement. In fact, often a case, if you're not using or doing something like this, you know, that's a real, you know, it's definitely an expectation. Um, actually, there was some research um, by what's known as the Swedish Institute that as a consequence of the studies it did, that actually only 14% of all absence, and I think this is, might be a global trend, but this is obviously done particularly uh, at Scandinavia, was actually due to physical sickness. There are all sorts of other reasons outside of physical sickness why people were absent uh, from work in Scandinavia. And actually, I'll go into a bit more detail on this in a moment, which is one of, uh, one of our clients. Through implementing a health and well-being scheme, which is actually really simple, as I say, I'll mention the details, this organization in one year managed to achieve a 30% reduction in absenteeism. Quite, in, quite interesting. Um, and actually, again, the Swedish Institute worked out that the average cost to the company per year for people being on long-term sick was £25,000. Okay, just a, a few tidbits to take away. Just quickly, in terms of Scandinavia itself, so Denmark is officially the world's happiest country. Okay, are you all familiar with Hugar? I called it Hig. Uh, for, many, for many years, until I was corrected by uh, a number of my uh, Danish colleagues. But it's quite an interesting thing, because one of the learnings I'll finish on at the end is, a lot of Scandinavian well-being sits around you know, a cultural mindset. And actually, in Denmark, you do see this really generally. It, it's about, you know, the culture is very much trying to focus on simple pleasures. Whereas I think, you know, one of the things that they reflect on in this world is, you know, certainly in the developed world, you know, we, we've never had more, you know, 
We've never had more wealth. We live in nice houses, cars, etc. And yet almost there are more people who are unhappy now than there were many years ago. And I think culturally for Denmark, this, you know, trying to just focus on life's simple pleasures. I don't know, looking at a nice view, taking in a sunset. You can see that's really embedded in their culture. And if you like simple things and you take pleasure in them, of course, you know, generally speaking, you're happier with your lot. And I do think you know, that, that sits right at the heart of that. The UK, just so you know, we're 23rd. So we're not doing so well, probably to, you know, for all the reasons we probably know in our heart of hearts. Um, Norway, very high life expectancy. Um, uh, we'll come on to what healthcare provision is there. It was interesting, the, the interesting although we think of the USA as one of the most sophisticated uh, countries in the world, they were ranked in the bottom third in terms of life expectancy. I think we probably know why, perhaps related to their healthcare system, but I'm not here to talk about, uh, about that. Um, and also Sweden, um, by this organization of economic cooperation and development, was also ranked very high. You know, great education, great health care. In Sweden, actually, uh, although it's not so prevalent here, but um, you know, they don't really have the concept of what you call private schools, for example, because state education is so great. Therefore, you know, potentially for those, you know, it, it's, uh, and the health care itself. If I just touch on health care, because I think this, uh, again, is, is interesting in terms of the different way uh, the organizations approach it. But actually, the key thing here is, that they're all actually sort of funded by, the by tax. So they're all state or municipality funded. For uh, Norway and Denmark, actually, they're funded by the state, so they have a single sort of health care that you know, gives you health care provision uh, for all. There are some rules specifically related to age and how much health care provision can be funded. Uh, we've moved beyond my uh, competence and expertise in terms of healthcare uh, in that country, I'm afraid. But, um, you know, it, it's all available online. The difference with Sweden is, Sweden's, it's, uh, it's very interesting as a country, it's divided into a whole range of municipalities, and healthcare is provided in each municipality. So it's completely decentralized. So although healthcare exists, it's not like that we have the NHS, which is, as we know, this central beast that exists, which is a fantastic institution. Um, those have all sorts of individual healthcare provisions across Sweden, but it works very, very well. Certainly the feedback we have, both from clients and the people I work with every day, say actually Swedish healthcare you know, is amongst the best in the world. So specifically now, just to drill into, uh, say, one of the things that you have specifically in Sweden is this health and wellness contribution. Whereas I've mentioned before, you're able to actually spend an amount of money on something that relates to your health and wellness, and it's tax-free. So it's a key piece of legislation in Sweden. And as I mentioned, 90% of all employers use this. You know, if you're not using it, you're very much behind, uh, behind the curve. I've mentioned before, the average spend is about 200, well, it is 210 uh, pounds. And actually also interestingly, as I mentioned, they've included things like golf and horseback riding, but also wellness. And I think this is a global trend really, you know, is becoming much more about, you know, what is wellness? It's not just physical well-being, it's mental well-being. Everyone, I believe, certainly in the developed world, is under much more financial stress than they used to be. Um, even in the Scandinavian um, countries. But it's hugely popular. I mean, if I'm honest, you know, Benefi built its business on the back of this contribution because it works quite well from a digital um, perspective. And it's very much seen as an expectation. Everyone talks about it. Benefi have about 100 different products you can buy at discounts for the wellness contribution and so on. It's a dizzying array of things. Um, and as I've mentioned, uh, this more, the more mental well-being now becoming much, much more important. And it's also, they're linking it to financial well-being as well. So I would say whilst, I mean, you know, if you look back in the UK, even five or six years ago, you're talking to uh, uh, people about financial education in the workplace. 
as a concept that didn't really exist then, I don't think. Whereas actually now, certainly under the, what I call the umbrella of well-being, the ability for people or the ability to support people in terms of what's a significant piece of stress in their life, you know, financial well-being. Again, in Scandinavia, that's a really big and growing thing. I would say it's perhaps a couple of years behind the UK in terms of the maturity of its market, some of the products and services that are there. But it's a really big, uh, becoming a really big form of, uh, uh, of um, discussion. Um, we're also seeing, uh, for certainly some of our bigger clients, the bigger employers, really investing in sort of cognitive behavior therapy to de decrease stress. So stress, even in Scandinavia, uh, again, it's been around in the UK, I think, for perhaps a few more years, but very much recognized now as also something that you know, can lead to people being off work, becoming more and more uh, prevalent. And you know, this psychological absence that they talk about in Scandinavia means the same thing, really. But again, coming back to this, only 14% of absence is caused by physical sickness. You know, there are all sorts of other reasons generally related to the complexity of the mind that lead people to be off work. And stress, much like other developed markets, very much on the rise in Scandinavia. Now here is a really, I love this example, because it's so simple, but the results are so significant. So actually, a client of Benefi's, albeit you know, this was their own uh, 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 um, idea, was, so <coughs> they're one of the largest Swedish municipalities, so think of it like a public sector um, organization who are in public sector housing, actually. Um, again, very much a trend, both, I think globally, but in particular in Scandinavia, Money and compensation clearly is still important because it funds one's lifestyle. But actually, generally, the younger generations care much more about all sorts of other things as well. You know, having time to do things properly. Actually, they genuinely, genuinely care, you know, about the organization that they work for. Is it ethical? Do I have time off? Um, and so on. Sweden, actually, just so you know, are about to em enter what they call midsummer, which is tomorrow. Um, and actually, everyone then leaves for about five weeks. By law in Sweden, you're eligible, if you want, to take four consecutive weeks of holiday um, a year. It's one of the interesting things when you work in a global software business where a lot of people that you need over the summer are enjoying themselves at their summer houses uh, uh, somewhere. It's an ongoing debate and discussion I have uh, with my Scandinavian colleagues on a daily basis. But here in particular, they felt, as a consequence of their research, that time was far more valuable to them the money. And actually, what they decided to implement, they wanted to come back to the um, previous comment, and I spend a lot of my time talking about this. If you're going to do something, just keep it simple. Keep the rules simple, measure it, and then decide whether you want to do it again. So what they decided to do was they said, if you visit a gym three times a week, and we can measure it through scanning, okay, doesn't matter what you do, but if you do that three times a week for a year, you will get an extra week's holiday. So, you know, arguably you could say, well, I could go to the gym, have a coffee, and then leave. Yes, you could. But actually what we're saying is, again, keep it simple. You know, let's not put all these rules and regulations in. Didn't matter what you did at the gym, but the results were amazing. 30% reduction in absenteeism in the first year. Not correlation as to directly whether you could relate that reduction to this scheme, of course, but that was the only major initiative that they implemented this year. So the year after they implemented this initiative, 30% reduction in absenteeism. And it's really, really simple. Um, so it was one of my, uh, my favorite ones. So um, just to sort of finish now, if I think about my learnings on my journey, you know, it's working and sitting inside a Scandinavian business, spending a lot of time there with people, and this is more of the cultural uh, pieces that I think make Scandinavia really healthy and happier, I think, than other developed markets, um, are it has many of the same challenges that other countries face. Uh, you know, greater stress, there is greater psychological absence, um, it is a fast-moving world. Culturally, especially with things like Huga, are they better? 
Or, you know, are they better sort of aligned culturally from birth to cope with it? You know, that's a, a, a secondary um, a debate in itself. But actually, if you, look at those, um, if you look at those countries and their cultures as well, you know, you look at just their, their diet, their lifestyle, um, you know, a lot of very fish-based uh, diet, very, very much an outdoor uh, lifestyle ingrained really as a culture from, you know, from the day you were born. You know, those things, as we know, in terms of happiness and health, really, really help. Um, whereas I don't think it's quite so prevalent in other countries. As anyone knows that does regular exercise, um, you know, regular exercise is just so good for the soul. It's not just about keeping fit. I can be so stressed or angry about something, but I'm one of these classic middle-aged men. But if I go on a bike ride, at the end of it, I'm happy. The endorphins have done their job. Um, so, you know, and it's better than endorphins sometimes appear if you drink too much as well, but that has a, obviously another downside too. Um, and actually, the government very much supports this. You know, they're funding it with this wellness contribution, making it tax efficient. They have capped it. It used to be that you could spend any amount of money on it. But it, again, it sits at the heart of a sort of government strategy. We've seen a few things here in the UK that the UK have done, but largely speaking, quite a few of what they call those helping hands related to things you could do via salary sacrifice are sort of disappearing in this country um, uh, 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 as well. I also think, because of the smaller populations, it is slightly easier to focus on these things. Those Scandinavian countries are not as complex, per se, as something like the UK. So it does mean the ability to focus on these things is easier. And as I mentioned before, much like other markets, when we talk about well-being, it's not physical well-being, it's overall well-being with mental and financial well-being becoming much, much more of a focus. I think it really started to kick in in the UK maybe about four or five years ago, and in Scandinavia, we're really beginning to see people thinking and talking about it, probably perhaps over the last couple of years. And again, this isn't unique to Scandinavia, but it's the same really uh, all over the world. They again have a real challenge of an aging population. Everyone's getting older. Everyone's living longer. Everyone's relying on state funding for longer. Pensions or retirement plans aren't necessarily going to cover everyone until they die. You know, how do, how, you know, how do we manage that? Especially for a country where um, actually, you know, people, the, the, the life expectancy is longer than in other markets. So again, very, very typical, typical and similar things that other organizations are facing. So we've got a couple of minutes left, I notice. But I say, just a few tidbits or insight into what the Scandinavian countries are doing, how they work, um, uh, and so on. Uh, well, one thing, if you ever work for a Swedish headquartered business and you've come from a US headquartered business, you'll be surprised. This is nothing to do with well-being, although it stressed me out quite a bit. Sweden's very consensus-driven. Like uh, US multinationals, very much can command and control. We've made the decision and we move forward. Swedish organizations, I've just got used to this, you make a decision, but then you have a talk about the decision and then you make another decision. And then you should actually talk to some more colleagues about that decision to then decide whether that decision was a good one. So that's something, uh, for, certainly for my first sort of four to eight, four to eight months, uh, I found very interesting as I got used to um, how culturally Scandinavian businesses move forward. In many ways, it creates better loyalty, but it's, um, uh, it's been an interesting journey for me. So that's it. Thank you.